of the New Brighton area Historical Society, and uh, we want to welcome, welcome you all tonight. We've got quite a program planned, so uh, uh, plus we've got to take care of some of our own annual housekeeping work, like election of officers and things like that. So I want to mention that uh, I think Jim Neville handed out some tickets for a uh, raffle later, uh, and so that will be uh, announced later on. And we've got some uh, jam that one of our board members, Mary Bird, made a rhubarb jam and strawberry jam. It's fresh, it's fresh made, and it's absolutely delicious. We sell it for $5 a, uh, a jar, and it's uh, a fundraiser for our association. So uh, we've got coffee up there, and we've got uh, uh, cookies, and we've got books for sale. I don't know how many books we've got here, but uh, our books are excellent, and uh, you should, if you don't have one, you should really get one. So let's get the, um, the uh, meeting going then, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the first thing we do is approve our minutes from the previous year's annual meeting. And uh, I think they've been passed out to the board members, uh, not, not everyone. Joyce Collins is our secretary, and she prepared the minutes, and I read them, and the board members read them, and do we have a motion to accept them? Motion to approve? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, Wayne Searles is our treasurer, and uh, he's got a, a treasure report he's going to give. Uh, he had it on the screen, but uh, apparently we can't find it, so technical, technical difficulties. Yeah, Wayne. Thank uh, you. I was supposed to have this on the screen, but we couldn't quite get it that way. So, you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, we had a fairly decent year. We had income, total income of $12,480. If you've got a newsletter, it's in the newsletter. And, uh, yeah, yeah, we got copies up there. Uh, we had expenses of $10,972. So uh, we're booked at two thousand dollars to the good, which is good because we installed gutters around the uh, depot. The uh, snow and the rain would come off the roof, and it would uh, wear out the finish on the uh, deck, the deck board. So we'd have to refinish that thing all the time, and. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not so bad getting down there to do it, but you always got to have somebody to help you get up. <laughs> I'm speaking for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I. Anyhow, uh, we, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a part here. Uh, big thanks to Dajedio, 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 and the New Brighton Lions Club, who had their chili cook-off last October, designated funds to go to the New Brighton Area Historical Society. And uh, uh, Mary Berg uh, accepted a, a check from the Lions, from uh, Bell Johnson, and uh, that was the funds were designated to pay for our gutters. Uh, the gutters cost a little bit more than that, though. But, uh, we got a thousand dollars from the Eagles gambling fund, and there are uh, several individuals here tonight that have uh, contributed their private private uh, funds to us too, and we really appreciate that. So uh, we've just about got those gutters paid for, so it worked out pretty good. I guess that's all I can tell you about it. Thank you, Wayne. Any questions about our treasurer's report? I have one. Mary? How, how much is left on the gutters if we have a kind donator? How much do we have left to raise for our gutter, gutters? Around $2,000. Okay, thank you. In case somebody... Thank you. <laughs> 
I didn't bring my checkbook tonight, but keep it in mind for. Mom probably go get it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, usually, uh, formality is we need a uh, motion to accept the uh, treasurer's report. You no, know, this is a formal treasurer's report. Uh, do we have that motion? I accept. Okay. All in favor? Uh, second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Wayne. Wayne's our treasurer, and he does a. Uh, Excellent, excellent job. The uh, what I might we're take this chance right now to, to introduce our, our board members. We have ten board members, and uh, they all have come, come from varying backgrounds. Uh, they're all active, and uh, some have uh, extremely high uh, academic credentials. And a lot of us are just workers. You know? But uh, uh, I might. Uh, I'm the president, and uh, Joyce. Uh, there, Joyce Plant is our our uh, secretary. Wayne Searles, next to her, is uh, our treasurer. And um, I saw Mary Mary Berg. She's a former New Brighton council council person, and uh, she's a very active member. She's been on just less than two years, but she's really helped us with a lot of stuff. Uh, Ron Coda sitting over there. Uh, He's uh, been uh, on, the, on the board a long time. And probably the uh, uh, New Brighton original. He was born and raised here, like uh, some of us, like I have, and like Wayne Searles and some of the others here. Uh, Peg, Peg Joyce, she's a long time New Brighton resident and been on the board for a long, long time. Uh, Dr. Dave, Dave Peterson, you saw him last year when he did his. Uh, his uh, presentation on the arrowhead uh, from the north, north of Long Lake. Uh, the Nevels, uh, Jim and Lori, there they are. Uh, they're our youngest members, but uh, they have, but they, what's wrong with age and experience? Uh, but, but they do have a lot of uh, uh, capabilities in the area of fundraising and promotions, and uh, we just like their energy and their creativity, and uh, they've had a lot to the board. Now, I don't have a who did, who did I miss? Art, 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 Art. <laughs> the cameraman back there. Now, Art is a um, retired physics teacher, and he's our high tech guy, typically. <laughs> Today he had a few problems here, but we got it squared away, didn't we? Yeah. So, but uh, Art is on the board, and he's uh, maintains our web our website and a lot of uh, technical uh, computer uh, 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 chores that he does. I might add. One thing, a little bit of trivia, uh, Dave Peterson, who has a PhD in anthropology, was a grade school student of Mrs. Collins, Joyce there. And so, uh, uh, you must have did a good job, Joyce. You were a science teacher, and he got out and he got his PhD, what? I directed him all the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he gives you full credit too, by the way, so I know that for a fact. Uh, <laughs> uh, the next form of order of business is to elect a board of directors and elect the officers of the board. So uh, 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 we have uh, we uh, the president, vice president, treasurer, and secretary position open. So we are we welcome nominations from the floor. Anyone, you know, anyone that wants to nominate someone for one of those positions, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, is that enough peace? <laughs> the, uh, the, I'm, up, I'm up again for president. Um, uh, Joyce, you, you agreed to run for secretary again. And I might say, Joyce, uh, just if some of you don't know, she is actually one of the co-founders of the entire New Brighton Historical Society. And, uh, and she, 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 she's hanging on. And she is a, a, a creative whiz when it comes to, I mean, she, she basically does our, our semi-annual newsletter and lays out all the pictures and the print and all that, so she's very creative. Uh, and she's got a high amount of energy. So, uh, Joyce, we really appreciate that, okay? So, um, stay with us for a while. Say, Fred, could you ask Joyce how many posts she's put on the New Brighton History <laughs> Facebook page this year? How many? Two thousand. Two thousand. She's uh, she's 
What do you get your energy, Joyce? You know? I don't know. So, anyway, uh, uh, Dave Peterson, you, uh, you're you going to stay on the board, but you decided to be your, you can't accommodate the, the position of vice president, so you're going to step aside this year, and I believe uh, Jim Neville was going to uh, volunteer to take your spot. You volunteered me. <laughs> well, you've been, <laughs> you haven't been in the Army, you know how you volunteer. So, um, anyway, and uh, that's it. Wayne's going to be treasurer, uh, and we need, uh, we need votes to elect these uh, officers. So. I move to accept the nominees. Uh, the, the slate of nominees, you move to accept, do you have a second? I second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, congratulations, <laughs> officers. <laughs> uh, you, I think you've all got the, uh, most of you got the newsletter. Uh, we basically kick off the season uh, uh, with our rhubarb festival, but before that we have a cleanup on May 20th, and we like to have volunteers come up to the uh, depot, and there's a lot of yard stuff that's got to be cleaned up. They've got windows to wash, we've got uh, uh, dusting to do, and uh, uh, toilets to clean and, and basically get everything ready. We kind of we, we shut it totally down in the wintertime, so get everything ready for the spring season because uh, uh, 10 days later or so, uh, we've got the rhubarb pole. We picked rhubarb for a rhubarb festival. Rhubarb pole is on the 3rd of June, the festival is the 4th, and uh, we used to get about 10 or 12 or 15 volunteers to go up to Nathie's farm up in Elk River, and we pick about four or five hundred pounds of rhubarb. And uh, part of it we give to Key's restaurants, and they make the desserts Saturday night for a rhubarb festival on Sunday. And the rest of it we bundle in bundles and sell it uh, at the, our depot. And it's, it's really a good fundraiser. It's a lot of fun. And we've had as many as 300 people turn up on Sunday for our, and we typically sell out of our rhubarb bundles and of our, of our pastries. So it's really a fun event. And, uh, we look forward to that. That kicks off our summer. Depot officially opens on June 3rd, uh, and uh, we're open every uh, every weekend, so Saturday, Sunday, from one to three, one to four, excuse me, and uh, until September 27th, I think, or whenever we close, September 24th. So that's uh, that's what's going on uh, in June. And then of course we've got stockyard days in August. That's August. Uh, 11th to 13th this year. So uh, we typically have a tremendous amount of traffic up in our depot and we have, uh, uh, I don't know what we're gonna do with the fundraising this year. We, Culver's makes their ice cream booth available to us, but uh, uh, with COVID and all that the last few years, we've backed away from that. But uh, we'll see what we do what we do this year. That's up to our board. So, uh, and then September 24th, the depot closes down. So it's it just open for a few months and then we close, so. Uh, before we start the, start the program, I just want to thank uh, Dave, Dave Nath, he's, he, he's, he's a great guy. He's one of the go-to growers for, for uh, Bloods and Byerleys. He's got a, a high-tech farm up in Elk River, but he just got this fondness for rhubarb. And he's got uh, uh, several acres of rhubarb that he just lets us have access to every spring. And uh, it's really high-quality stuff. You, you know, it's a, a really red, juicy variety, and, uh, and people love it. So he's just been wonderful. And, uh, uh, Key's restaurant. Uh, so far, they, they they take several hundred pounds and they they, they make the pastries. They make, they make it big, huge sheets, and uh, some of you have been up there. It's it's, uh, it's, it's very very good. So, uh, Bicycles Hardware uh, sells our books, and they do a pretty darn good job of it. And, uh, and we want to thank them. Uh, Culver's Restaurant does a promotion. I don't know when it is this year. Uh, Jim Nibble, I think you talked to him. About the, we picked a weekend for the summer, I think, where they donate a percentage of their their, their ice cream drinks to our cause, and they typically raise several hundred dollars, several hundred dollars for for us. So uh, that's that's uh, that's very helpful. And uh, as Wayne mentioned, the Lions Club has been great, the Rotary Club has been great, uh, Eagles have been wonderful, you know, giving us stuff. And as Wayne mentioned, the Dodgers Restaurant up on Silver Lake Road. So. Uh, uh, it's just been uh, it's just been, uh, been very helpful to, to have all this support. 
And most of all, we got the, all these volunteers that come out to come to our depot. They help us uh, help us with projects, help us get the rhubarb thing going. So uh, it's it's been uh, it's been very very good. So uh, with that, I think I want to have Joyce uh, start her program. And it's about old houses in uh, New Brighton, including our depot house. Thank you, for Thank you for Now I need to know if your microphone is working. Yeah. Art? Yeah. Okay. All right, so this program intends to show early New Brighton area homes and homesteads. We'll show you the house as it was, prevent some history, and then as it looks now. However, we could not cover all the old homes in New Brighton, but in the New Brighton area, but we'll cover a lot. But the Foss House is, is the one that is the most known to us, and I'd like to introduce our Foss House owners right now, Kathy and Dave Brewer, who own the Foss House. And then I will read to you this. The, the Peter Foss House is located at 321 Silver Lake Road, just east of Silver Lake and was designed and built around 1892 to 1894. The pic picturesque home is still standing, a little bit that way, is still standing, and is historically and architecturally significant as the largest and most intact Victorian home in New Brighton, according to the National Register and the Minnesota Historical Society. So today it's listed on that National Historic Register. Foss was a farmer and fisherman in Norway. He began farming when he came to the Monsey Township in the 1880s. He and his wife Ingerborg raised their six children on the farm. You all know where this house is, don't you? On Silver Lake Road. And when I was growing up, we always called it the witch's house. I don't know if you did. But the land on which the Foss house stands was previously farmed by the Bowers family who settled at the Silver Lake site at least as early as 1874. Josephine Bowers, a widow, sold the land on which the house stands to Peter and Ingeborg Foss. The house was built in those years, 1892 to 1894. The family moved into the house in 1894, and in 1944, Peter Foss divided his properties amongst his family, giving the house and 10 acres to his daughter, Esther Swanson. Here's a picture of how it looked in 1980, which was the year that the Historical Society was formed. And there's a side view of it. And here's the Foss House today. And this comes directly from a Christmas card that Dave and Kathy sent me. Isn't it charming? I just love this picture. Then there's the Swan and Hannah Swanson House. The Swanson Dairy Farm was located at 578 Silver Lake Road. The farm was established around 1900 by Swan and Hannah. They sold raw milk directly to customers on routes in northeast Minneapolis. The farmhouse was built in 1914. The previous house was then turned into a garage seen on the left. And after Swan died, Hannah and her children, Jelmer, Ernest, Anton, and Hilma, Hilma ran the farm. And Anton Swanson married Esther Foss in 1926. That's the connection to the Foss family. This house still stands. Do you, do you know where it is? It's right on Silver Lake Road and Fifth Street. And it sits back a little bit, and it has trees now in front of it. But there is how it looked in 1980, and there is how it looks today. And it's home to Burkhart Plumbing today. It's a remarkably beautiful house, still in great shape from when it was built. And in the late 1920s, Sears Roebuck and Company offered homes via catalog. This one looks somewhat like the Swanson House, if I go back to that, right? But I doubt that they use this service. But many homeowners took advantage of having their home provided by Sears. And here, craftsman style homes were very popular during the 1920s and 30s. You may have seen homes like that in our area. Now we're gonna move into the Arden Hills area, Charles and Aurelia Perry. They were the first residents of Moundsview Township in 1849. 
The homestead was on the western shore of Lake Johanna where Charles grew potatoes. Charles and Aurelia raised 13 children there. This home was built in 1871 and the photo was taken sometime in the 1900s. Part of this house is still standing and until the past years had been occupied by a great granddaughter of Charles and Aurelia and she's here tonight. There they are, Clark and Ida Nam. Adair. The Perry home today sits kitty quarter from Lake Johanna Beach. Charles Perry was the son of Marianne Borkin and Abraham Perry, who were early settlers of St. Paul, who were among the settlers of the Selkirk colony in Canada in the early 1820s. Aurelia was a daughter of Francois Latender and Jean Baptiste Morissette of Quebec. Charles Perry operated their popular bathing and picnic beach at Lake Johanna, which son William took over at Charles' death. Charles Perry spent the last 55 years of his life at his place on Lake Johanna. When he died at age 88 in 1904, he was then the oldest settler in Ramsey County and had lived continuously in Minnesota for 78 years. So guess what? The house is still standing. I talked to the Perry cousins and they tell me it is now an Airbnb. So I went to the site and here is what the home looks like today as an Airbnb. Now the Perry family or Clark and Ida Nan sold it to a neighbor who rented it out for a while and we're not sure whether that person is running the Airbnb or somebody else has taken it. He does. He does. So you can go and stay in one of the oldest homes in the New Brighton area. This is the home where William II and Ojalia Divine lived. This house still stands on 664 10th Street in New Brighton. His father, William, William Divine I, and wife Florence Lillian, owned the Divine Hill in downtown New Brighton. Do you remember seeing this house? It's by the railroad tracks. And that's the view of it in the 1960s, and that's how it looks today. You recognize it? I happened to live in the house right next door to that. My parents rented the house next door to the Divine House at the time. And there was a little trailer home in the middle, and we used to babysit there as well. Gospel Ridge of New Brighton. Many of the early homes in New Brighton on 3rd, 4th, and 5th Avenue earned the name Gospel Ridge. The name came from the heavy involvement of activities related to the New Brighton Congregational Church on 5th Avenue. Here's an early photo of a residential street, 4th Avenue and 7th Street, in the old Gospel Hill area of the early village. Notice the dirt streets. <laughs> Here's the Charles and Murdy May Espinet House. This house belonged to Charles and Murdy May at 678 Fourth Avenue. Charles Espinet was the agent at the Stockyards Depot, which he operated ever since coming to the Young Village in 1897 until his retirement in 1938 when the station was closed. The house was later known as the Jandell House, where inventor William James operated his telephone and electricity equipment. The house still stands. The Espinet home in 1980, which was once owned by Winfried and Miriam Claussen, my parents, that's the house I grew up in. And that's how it looks today. It still stands. It's got to be 1890s. This was the second home of the Espinet family. It was built in 1925, and the home still stands at 447 6th Street, across the street from the former First Congregational Church of New Brighton. And this is the, how the home looks today. It's just amazing to me how these homes look so much like they did when they were built. And they were obviously built very well because they've lasted. Here is, is the Amel uh, Amy and Amelia Dupre house. This is located right next door to my house at 672 Fourth Avenue. Amy and Amelia were the parents of Gladys Divine Walbon and they rented the house. Later, it was owned by Roy and Elsie Chuck. 
than by the Newham family. And we have a, a Chuck gal here today. Raise your hand. Did you grow up in that house? Nope, that would have been my grandparents. Okay, okay. And the home looks the same today, doesn't it? Here's the home located at 703 4th Avenue, the Roy and Helen Kaczynski house. It was also lived in by the Stanislavski family. Now, is that correct? Am I saying that correct? Yes. Okay. All right, there is the home today. Now, many of these home uh, pictures from today came from Google Street View. And the other ones, I just drove and took the pictures myself with everybody watching who is this lady taking <laughs> pictures of our house. This home still stands. This is the John DeMars home, located at 681 Fifth Avenue. It's owned by John DeMars, who was the oldest of 24 children born to Ken Deal and Adeline Lemlin. He was the brother of Ida, Mrs. William Perry. The original St. John the Baptist Church was located just to the north, and this photo was loaned by DeMars' granddaughter. And look how much it looks like today preserved nicely. I grew up right behind the alley with, from this home, and my dear friend Joanne Prickett lived in that DeMars house growing up as well. Yes? Say that again. Who donated the picture? Ethel Rayberger. I'm sorry, I can't hear those questions. I have a hearing issue. I'll talk with you later, okay? Here is another view of the DeMars home. Walter and Lydia Beiswinger Olson home was located just to the south. Both homes are still standing. Riding in the buggy are Adolph and Maple Bills Beiswinger and Carl and Lillian Borden. And that's how the house to the, to the right looks today. This home is still standing at 305 6th Street. It was built in 1919 for the Shirley and Mana Reasoner family, which also included children Rollin, Margaret, and Marion. And look how much it looks like it today. Now you'll remember this house on 6th Street because it has the red barn in the backyard. Do you, do you know where I'm talking about? in wonderful shape yet. Here's the Searles home. Wayne, where are you? Okay. The Searles home was located at 657 4th Avenue and still stands on the east side of the street. In 1889, William Franklin Searles was the owner of a coal, lumber, and feed business and became the local postmaster. Pictured here are wife Sadie with Franklin and daughter Mana, son Dewey in the wagon. Other children included Coy and Maud Searles. The house is still standing. And it does look pretty much the same. They've, they've removed all of the filigree around the, the porch, but it looks very much the same. And next door to the Searles home is the Carl and Lillian Olson Borden home at 663 4th Avenue. And there's the Borden home today. The Schmalzbauer home in 1905 was located on the site of the former municipal liquor store on Fifth Avenue in downtown New Brighton, now the present day Brighton Green townhomes. The home was later bought by Son Butch and moved to 790 Fifth Avenue where it still stands today. Early resident Otto Schmalzbauer came to New Brighton near the turn of the century to establish himself as a foremost businessman, cattleman, butcher, realtor, village of Fifth official and to raise a large and prominent family. Do you know where this is? Kitty Corner from City Hall. Just Kitty Corner across the street. Here is pictured Hubert Langer's first home in 1911 in the Rice Creek Irondale area. Truck gardener Hubert Langer developed tomatoes that had the reputation as nicest on the market. Hubert, married to Jenny Langner, also hired a number of employees to help with their garden, and their daughter, Leon, went to market herself after her father's death. That house no longer stands, but next, there is the Nils and Leon Aronson home on 
2120 Long Lake Road on Rice Creek. This house still stands today. It's about where the bridge is. You know where that would be on Long Lake Road? And it, it doesn't face the street, it faces the creek. And the creek was very, very important in New Brighton history because as a little child, Leon would go and dig up arrowheads in the creek. And that is, was the basis for our last year's annual meeting, that arrowhead collection that she gave to the Historical Society. Here's the first and only home of Frank A. and Eleanor Bona Blansky. It was built in 1932 and sold in 1987. It still stands at 5051 Long Lake Road, originally the Irondale residential area. And you couldn't see it very well, but look, the door is the same. The front door is the same. Here's the Farrell home. The John and Mary Farrell home is located on County Road E2 and New Brighton Road, just west of the former Ramsey County Library in Arden Hills. The Farrell family purchased the land from Major McLean, the local Indian agent. They farmed more than 500 acres on what is now located St. John the Baptist Church Complex and Moundsview High School. The home still stands. Farrell, who came to Minnesota in 1857, married Mary Doran in Lindsborough County, Waterford, Ireland. The Farrells first lived on Pig's Eye Island in St. Paul before they moved to Moundsview Township. Old Bet, a well-known Indian woman, became friends with Mrs. Farrell. In 1949, son Tom Farrell donated 10 acres of land to St. John's Catholic Church for their new parish, school, church, convent complex being planned and the Farrell property extended as far as Moundsview High School to Lake Johanna Beach. When first coming to the area, the Farrells lived in a house on the small island on Lake Johanna. Later, they bought 160 acres and added to it until there were 500 acres. Of the three boys and four girls, only two of the children married. And you can see this home nestled in its picturesque haven of land, hills, and fields southeast of New Brighton. Do you know where this is? County Road E2, right? Still stands. Here's the William and Rosalie Perrin home. The home of William and Rosalie Perrin is still standing near the corner of Cleveland Avenue and County Road E, First Avenue Southeast. This photo was taken about 1920. William and Rosalie raised five children, Elmer, Marie, Albert, Violet, and Nick Perrin. The home was later occupied by the Ed Lawmeyer family. And we have, there they are, we have a pair, uh, Lawmeyer here today, <laughs> and Perrin as well. Now, here are some New Brighton homes that were raised, but they were significant to our history. This home located on Third Avenue, belonged to George Kincaid, who was the son of Nellie Perry, Charles Perry's daughter. It was raised when the Golden Pond Senior Apartments were built. And located next to the Kincaid home, this home belonged to Ed and Hel Helen Shuda. It too was raised when the Golden Pond Senior Apartments were built. This home located at 745 Fourth Avenue was the Barichka family home from 1945 when they purchased it until 1990 when it was sold. The home was built in 1925 and has been raised. A new home on the same location was occupied by a grandson of Julius and Rosina Barichka. The next home is the home of Mr. and Mrs. Jack Bona and was located on Fourth Avenue in New Brighton. The home was taken for a new public center Safety Center in 2002. This photo shows the Hip family home, which was located in present day Long Lake Regional Park. Great grandfather Peter Hip began farming the land in the 1880s. His son Frank Hip and eventually his grandson Joe continued the farm. Joe Hip operated the Lakeside Berry Farm for many years, and four generations of Hip lived on the property. Now this home area is marked on the trails in Long Lake Park. So if you walk along the trails, you'll, you'll see the home, where the home site was. But the home burned several, many, many years ago as well. And um, the Hip family 
or Joe Hip sold that property to the city of New Brighton. And the story was that a million dollars worth of rhubarb and strawberry plants were moved to Elk River, which is the same rhubarb we get for the rhubarb fest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this home was later called the Orchard House as an apple orchard grew next door on Fifth, Fifth Avenue. In later years, it was owned by Otto Schmelzbauer. Other owners included the Stenina family. People in the front are not identified. There. Please write on the back of your photos <laughs> because I have run into many issues of not knowing dates or people. Here's the family home of Jacob and Teresa Lear. The home was located on the north side of 10th Street near where the Long Lake Estates apartments are now located. It was torn down in 1987. And this is a photo of the rear of the Paul and Catherine Blansky home located at 669 6th Street. It was demolished in 1969. Standing in front is Francis Blansky Johnson. Shown here was the homestead of Felix and Mary Slatowski, who, cho who came to New Brighton in 1904 and homesteaded 40 acres along Long Lake Road near today's 14th Street. Mr. Slatowski acquired 60 additional acres in today's golf course area. The farm was chiefly a dairy operation. Now outside of New Brighton, all of these homes have been raised, but this was the homestead of David Lutz, located on County Road I and Long Lake Road. There was a family, David, Cecilia, Marion, Miles, and Gladys Lutz, and Mrs. Troseth. The home is longer, it, no longer there, but the original photo was loaned by Gladys Lutz Hagland, daughter of David and Celia Lutz. Many of you probably remember the Hagland family in New Brighton. Here's the Josephine and Paul Walduck homestead. I won't read everybody, it's on there, but the homestead was later sold to Otto Schmalzbauer. It was located on Highway 8 in Mountsview and was later taken for the arsenal construction. And next to it is a photo of the John and Clara Pletcher homestead in 1920. John became Plet began Pletcher's greenhouses on Old Highway 8 in 1920. The home is no longer standing but all of us have been to our beloved Pletchers, haven't we? And we celebrated their 102nd anniversary last fall. Here's the homestead of Nicholas and Agnes Patel, the Indicoich, located in Moundsview Township. Original home was situated on County Road I after having been moved from Arsenal Hill. And the Frank and Josephine Waldock home was located on Long Lake Road until just a few years ago when it was raised for new home construction. Here's the O'Connell home. He purchased 90 acres of land at Moundsview Township in 1902. Later, 60 more acres were added. It was located south of County Road H2 and east of Long Lake Road. It was built in 1908. John gradually sold parcels of the land for homes, including a large tract where Edgewood Middle School now stands, and had 25 acres left. The remaining 25 acres with the buildings were sold in 1972 and the buildings were demolished and new homes were built. This is the home of William and Anastasia Ryback on Old Highway 8 in Moundsview. The State Department bought the owners out in 1938 to improve the road for arsenal traffic. And this was the home of Frank and Stella Skiba in 1890. It was located across from the arsenal on Old Highway 8 Frank's parents, Joseph and Mary Anskiba, came to Minnesota from Canada in 1869 and brought property in Moundsview Township in 1870. Joseph and Mary Ann had 13 children, the oldest of whom was Frank, and the home no longer stands. Here is the homestead of Clement and Rose Blansky Skiba. The home was located in Moundsview Township and was condemned during World War II for a huge state highway project forced by heavy traffic in the Twin City Federal Arsenal Federal Defense Plant area. Pictured here is Gene Skiba, the son of Clement and Rose. Here's the homestead of the John Moga family. The family, the house was built in 1897, but the land was homesteaded in 1881. 
John's parents, Benedict and Victoria Mogus, first home was only 12 by 16, not much of a shack, John Mogus said. Its walls were packed with raked up leaves and hay as insulation against the severity of winter, and the home no longer stands. Which segues into our house, the New Brighton History Center. Bulward Junction was built in 1887, and here's how it looked as it sat in its original site in South New Brighton. We have no date on this, but Wayne Searles just found this picture from family members. But that's how it looks now. But it did not look like that back early. Our house had living quarters for the station master's family. Kitchen, living room, master, and children's bedroom. The Sioux line gave us the boat, the depot in 1982. Bob Proger of Proger House Movers moved the depot to city property and he remained there for, until 1990 while we fundraised to move and renovate the depot. We wrote a grant to celebrate Minnesota and were awarded $25,000 for renovating that depot, for that, the depot. Most of which went for moving it through the city of New Brighton electric telephone lines, and putting a basement under it. But we had lots and lots of help with that. Whoop. There's how the depot looked at its original location on the south end of town. Then the big move through the city. Then the depot sitting on city property. And then the depot would sit on these cribs before the basement was built. The basement was now completed. Then we completed, then we tackled the exterior. All exterior boards were removed and sanded off site to prevent lead paint seeping into the wetlands. Rick's roofing provided free labor to re roof the depot. And I remember the day when the first day they got on, on the roof and their feet went right through the, the roof. So they had, we had to replace all the boards as well as the shingles and everything. Now to start on the interior, this is how it looked. Many of our senior members provided their help. Here's Louise Perrin, Louise Hip, and Gladys Walvon cleaning the filthy walls. Here's Dave Brewer, Jean Skiba, and Lenny Klontz, my late husband, cleaning the wooden walls and 13-foot high ceilings. Before painting, walls and ceilings had to be scrubbed with TSP, trisodium phosphate, and hot water. We so appreciated all of our volunteers who provided many hours of service. That's how it looked in the kitchen. The station master's family tried to make the depot more livable by wallpapering the walls and putting up ceiling tile. Unfortunately, wallpaper was tacked in place and then tiles nailed in place. We hand removed thousands of nail holes, holes throughout the living area before we could start on the interior renovation. Whoop, 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 whoop. Okay, nail holes patched on the children's bedroom walls. Note the unevenness of a construction. Railroads didn't spend a lot of money building their depots. But the maple flooring throughout was in fairly good condition. A few areas had flooring standing on edge from a leaky roof. After sanding, we wrote a grant to Valspar, which provided for gym finish for all the floors in the depot. We received several grants from Bells Bar Corporation through their picture and painted program, including exterior paint, interior paint, and gym varnish. Bells Bar provided remark invaluable guidance on the type and color of paint that they donated. The society received two awards from Bells Bar for documentation on the exterior and interior renovation. We had to do that as part of the grant. All of the windows were broken when we received the depots. So we had to reglaze new glass, courtesy of by Swingers Hardware. The two chimneys were taken down before moving the depot as they were dangerous. My husband rebuilt both with fabric, and they now look original. In 1994, the Society was bequeathed the railroad collections of former Ramsey County Sheriff Kermit Hedman and his wife. Eileen Hedman, the second female village clerk of New Brighton. The Hedmans lived on Fifth Avenue about where the New Brighton Public Safety Building is now. Here are some of the Hedman items on display. It was a wonderful collection. It took us forever to pick it all up and, for, and we had to document every single piece we got. 
in order to get it, uh, get it from them. The Hedman collection numbered over 3,000 items from which we were able to add interesting display areas to our museum. However, we have never forgotten that we are a museum for the entire New Brighton area, not just a railroad museum. I forgot to finish that sentence, but <laughs> finishing up the renovation, the city of New Brighton built our sidewalk and parking lot. As you can see, we needed help from many different groups. Sod was laid, trees were planted, and we were ready to open in 1995. Five long years of renovation completed. Shown below is Mayor Bob Benke with Senator Steve Novak and me at the depot dedication. In 1992, Valspar Corporation wrote to statewide cities wanting to donate their caboose, which was located near the Metrodome. It was used as the break room for their employees. The city of New Brighton encouraged us to apply for it, so I wrote another grant, and we soon found we were one of three finalists, one being the Mall of America. The final criteria was how are we going to get the caboose to our property. Valspar named it La Caboose and they stripped the interior, stripped it, and put paneling up. <laughs> Williams Pipeline volunteered to build the rail siding for us, and what a job that was, but they had the equipment. Armstrong Crane would move the, the caboose from the main track to our siding. Armstrong per, 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 performed the service gratis. I'll never forget that day because they came out and they had one large belt around the caboose. And as, as soon as they were ready to move it, they decided, nope, they had to go back and put two large belts around it. And then they swung it around and we all said, it's that old adage, measure twice, cut once, because it fit. It fit on the track. Once the caboose was sighted on the siding, it was time to repaint it. So Bell's Fire Corporation provided the paint. Great Northern provided the good decals for us, and Jerry and Dan Lawmeyer did all the painting. However, after painting, we found that Great Northern gave us the wrong number. It should be X271, not X265. We'll correct it the next time we paint. Valspar had stripped the interior and applied wood paneling to the walls, and in the fall of 2014, the society began the renovation to return the caboose to its 19. 50s look. Paneling and wet insulation were removed. Interior steel walls were mitigated of mold. Car siding was installed on the walls and ceiling. New windows were built and constructed of bulletproof plexiglass donated by DeMar Signs. We forever were having kids throw rocks through the windows. And they have not since we have the plexiglass bulletproof. Flooring was repaired, sanded and varnished, caboose, furnish, caboose furnishings were constructed. So here are some photos from before, during and after the renovation with completion in June 2016. Again, many contributed to the project. Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway Foundation, Great Northern Historical Society, New Brighton Lions, Rotary, Sportsman's Club, as well as many individuals. We are not afraid to beg. <laughs> we consulted with the Lake Superior Railroad Museum in Duluth on appropriate paint colors and furnishings. And we must give credit, where credit is due, to Wayne Soros, who did a lot of this project, as well as Fred Behrens. And that's how it looked before we painted it. And then when we painted it, that was the color of cabooses at the time, kind of a lime green, and we looked at it they sent us a chip of it, we sent it to Valspar, and they said this is it, but it looks very, very nice. You'll have to stop in and see it. So what else do we do? Well, for many years we sponsored a rhubarb fest, and Fred talked about it, and we'll do it this year. This is, this, this is the crew that goes and picks rhubarb. We have some of those people here today. Raise your hand if you're a rhubarb picker, or the puller, which is the right word? Okay, you pull rhubarb, okay. And here's all the people that come. And we now have a full-time 
rhubarb jam maker here with Mary Berg, and she has some here to sell today. We sell cookbooks, we sell plants, we sell stocks. We serve, really, he said 200, but it really, he said 300, but it, I said 200, it is 300. And we have stimulating annual meetings. Here's Dr. David Peterson at his presentation. I won't pronounce that word because I can't. <coughs> the Dakota People on Long Lake in 2022. At that same meeting, we presented the Shoreview Historical Society with this 1903 train board of Sioux Lines Depot, Cardigan Junction, which was located in Shoreview, but now raised. We always would hope that our Shoreview Historical Society was able to have that. So we have a representative here today. Thank you for coming. Andy Eurista, during his program on historical reservation in 2020, showing one of the four wagon wheels he rebuilt for our baggage cart on our deck. He also restored our mail cart, both shown before renovation was done. Andy, raise your hand. <laughs> and we celebrated Civic Pride, a program produced by Wayne Searles in, uh, a few years ago. And who did we, the Rotary, the Lions, and the Sportsman's Club were all honored at that presentation. When Ice Castles came to Long Lake Park, the Society did a program called Ice Castles and Ice Harvesting on Long Lake. We featured photos and history of the St. Paul Winter Carnival Ice Castles, the Ice Castles in Long Lake Park in 2019, and how many local families earned their living cutting ice in Long Lake over the years. And we honored Pletcher's Greenhouses on their 102nd anniversary in October 2022. Top picture shows John and Glenn greeting each other at the program, and it was so tender because they had not seen each other. They both were in different nursing homes at the time, and that's the moment they greeted them. We had a cake for them, and then grandson Brian showed a little bit of the history. One of the things we wanted to know was, how do you know when to plant what? And they knew, he knew. And we had over 30 Pletcher family members come to that event. Plank engraving. Shortly after our deck surrounding the depot was built, we started selling engraved plank names. We now have engraved 672 planks with names of our donors. The project is a major fundraiser for us and helps us to pay our utility bills, propane, insurance, and various other expenses. In the top, we see Jerry Bensing, and in the bottom, Ron Coda engraving planks. Raise your hand, Ron. A big, big job. Like Fred said, everybody on this board does something. We have no sitters. They're all doers. Photo collections. We have... 5,000 photos from 191 donors, the majority of which have been scanned or copied. We maintain a Facebook page, New Brighton Area Historical Society, which shared approximately 1,000 photos. That's up to 2,000 now. We also share on neighborly New Brighton, and if you grew up in New Brighton, and occasionally I'll do, add something to the Shoreview area one and the Arden Hills one, especially if it has something to do with our area. We have walking tours. We place tour signage in Long Lake Park, marking the locations of the Lakeside Berry Farm, the stockyards, which were prominent in New Brighton in the 1890s, including the ice house locations, the railroad time turntable, an engine house, water tower, and the pump house. The walking tour starts on the west side of the beach, and here's the brochure that we hand out to our guests when they come. And we sell books. We have four books since 1980, three hardcover and one softcover. And you can buy those at Pie Swingers. They've been so loyal about letting us sell them there. Community Center, City Hall, at our History Center, and by mail. Stockyard Days. We've been active in Stockyard Days since its inception in 1981. In fact, the first two years, Stockyard Days was sponsored by us and the New Brighton JCs. The third year, Sock Air Days was incorporated to include all the civic groups in New Brighton. Bylaws were adopted and 12 New Brighton organizations were given directorships. The Eagles, Eagles Auxil Auxiliary, 
Historical Society, Lions and Lioness, JCs and JC Women, the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary, the Sportsman's Club, the League of Women Voters, and the city. And as soon as they did, they did this, we, we at the Historical Society went, <laughs> they now took it over. They've now completed 41 years as an event. In 2020, the Society honored its, honored its longtime volunteer, Lenny Klontz, my deceased husband, who spent hundreds of hours working on the depot, exterior, interior, and building the deck surrounding the depot. A park bench in his honor sits in front of the New Brighton History Center in Long Lake Park, and board members Wayne Searles and Ron Coda are shown installing the bench. Weddings. For some reason, our house is often the location for wedding photos, particularly on the caboose steps. Here's a few we've managed to capture. They just love it. And if we're there, if they come on a weekend and we're open, I always run out and take a picture. When are we open? We're beginning the first Sunday in June through September 1st to 4, 1 to 4. We invite you to join us, but we also will do any off-hour tours as well. And that's our board, and they're all here tonight. See you all. So, we encourage membership in our group. Here's membership rates. I have some some forms over on the table. If you are interested, we'd love to have you join us. And thanks for allowing us to share our story about historic homes and our home. Come and see us this summer. Oh, one other thing. We also have a virtual tour available on our website. So all you have to do, go to newbrightonhistory.com virtual tour, you can Take a tour. Take a tour. Joyce? Yes? Will your slideshow presentation be available? It will be available there. Uh, will it be on your website? Yes. Awesome. Where? Well, I guess it's not. Shows I get it done. <laughs> <laughs> I might stay up late tonight, but all of the previous productions are on our website. Okay, thank you. That was excellent. I learned something. I learned a lot. We went to high school together and went to high school together. Graduated the same year, same time. She had higher grades than me. Didn't you? <laughs> anyway, that was wonderful. So comprehensive. My God. And the, the, the work they went through to get that depot uh, from the original site, move it, put the basement in, Take all of it. took a lot. It took five years, didn't it? Once you had it in place. I mean, that was that was before my time. I was uh, I was in California then, so I, I missed all that fun. Yes. Dave. Can I ask you a question, Joyce? Um, so you just gave us a great presentation with so much information, and a lot of that information is also in our book on the history of. Yes. And I just want to show that to everyone, that uh, if, if you're interested in a copy, come and check it out afterwards if you don't have one. Um, you did a great job distilling a ton of information and added to it. Thank you so much. I presented the second half of that program to the, the uh, Shoreview DAR Club, Daughters of the American Republic, last month. So when I had that part done, I thought, well, maybe we could do this for our annual meeting because we have not told our story enough. Mm -hmm. And you could tell that today. There's a lot of things that we've done that we're very, very proud of. Yeah. I got, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 of those. Are, they're big. No, we have like and it goes all the way back into the 40s, I believe. There's like 50. There's What's like 50. that? 70 people. 70. Oh. <laughs> 74. We're trying to find a place to put them in it. 1958 to 2008. Yeah, we work with Jackie. Jackie was very helpful. In fact, we used Jackie, Jackie's truck to get them over here. Jim, Jim, Jim went over there, and I don't know how helped you, but and they were heavy, and they were dark, and it was cold, and they were damp, and uh, uh, down in the basement, we had to drag them up. So. Um, 
Good, good job, Jim. Good job. Very. Before we move on from the books, uh, this is the first time I've seen them because they got them while I wasn't here over the winter. And I understand we have to figure out how to store them properly. Yes. So, you know, we do fundraising and we don't do a very good job of it. But um, we probably are going to have to do some more fundraising to figure out how to properly store those. Uh, so I just want to throw that yeah. out. Yeah. Anybody know that wants to help us? Yeah, that's a project for this, this spring and summer, getting those books properly stored in all the way. Uh, what's that? What have you got? Other business? It's not monkey business, is it? Huh? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm the new vice president of the New Brighton Area Historical Society. And this is what happens when you join only a year ago, a year and a half ago. You get, you get thrown under the bus. But my wife and I are, my wife Lori over there, we're very uh, proud and honored to work with the Historical Society. And I also enjoy working with the Shoreby Historical Society. And Pam, visit, or Pam Vincent is sitting here. Her, her and her sister, twin sister, they call themselves the Diggers. And they are the go-to people for looking for relics. So, and I don't know if you know this, Pam, but in our depot, there's uh, some scuba divers went into Long Lake and found uh, one of these picks that you put on the ice block and pull the ice block up on the, so that's the kind of stuff that you run into. Right. Metal. Yeah. We do land and shoreline and lakes. So. so uh, we've done a lot of property for the farmsteads and, and uh, shoreview for the families. Uh, we've found a lot of relics um, and just a lot of really interesting things that we've donated to the Historical Society. Everything we do is free. Uh, anything that we find, the owner keeps. We just ask if we can take pictures and do a video. We don't disclose where we are. We don't use people's names, anything like that. But we have found a tremendous amount of things from generations ago um, from these farms. And we have quite a few commissions lined up this uh, starting in another week or so. But if anybody is interested, we would be more than happy um, to go to your land and metal detect and, and find any artifacts or history that's on the land. And everything we do is free. We've probably done six, seven hundred hours that we've donated to the Shoreview families uh, with their homesteads. So anyway, we're, it's really a lot of fun. Uh, we grew up in Shoreview. We grew up on Snail Lake. Um, our family was a heritage family last year for the Historical Society. And we're really involved. And uh, so we want to also get involved here with New Brighton too because we grew up here. And, uh, and we're just really excited to see Everything that you guys have done here with the, with the um, train station, the caboose, right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a barn for our property um, at the Historical Society. Um, which our building is located right across from Turtle Lake School, and that's what we're working on right now. Um, we don't have the space for a museum. Um, and what, what we want to do is all the artifacts that we found and that we're and people have donated, we want to turn this barn into our museum. So that's kind of our dream right now. So that's what we're hopefully working on, working with the city to make it happen. We have a barn that, that uh, someone is willing to donate in Shoreview. And we're hoping that things can get worked out and we can get the barn moved to our property. So. I'll be in. I'll be invested in this for the rest of my life. It's just something that I'm really have passionate about. So I want to thank you all because I was really looking forward to coming to this meeting. So thank you. And Pam has a sister that looks just like her, so you get the two for. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. Pam projects really well. I should have given you the microphone. Uh, yeah. Pam, if you 
if you run across a bottle of whiskey or a bottle for whiskey <laughs> bottled in the Brighton, would you think about donating one to us? Because I don't think we have one. I know most of you have been up, most of you have been up the depot. And uh, it's uh, very impressive. Like I said, uh, we've had visitors from South Africa, uh, Nepal, uh, Sweden. I mean, it's it's a it's in a high visibility area during the summertime with that uh, road into the Long Lake Park, and so we get just lots of visitors, and it's a it's really a pleasure to see them all come, and they're really quite dumbfounded when they see everything there and how it's put together and how it's curated. And that'd be our principal curator right over there. So it uh, it all came together. Now we're in the process of gradually uh, evolving some of the uh, exhibits and a few new things coming in, and it's where do you put the old stuff, so uh, it's a constant process, but the board is hard working and, uh, and we're, getting, we're getting it all done, so. Uh, and, and you mentioned the books, if you haven't, in fact, Joyce Collins wrote two of the books, hardcover books, and did the, the snippet book as well, the third, and then the other one is from, uh, from uh, Skybot, who, uh, yes, uh, Ron? I know. That's a big one. Jim uh, Neville, you were over there. Uh, Lily Newspapers went out of business, and they published the New Brighton Bolton for 30 or 40 years. I remember that was it. Long story short, when they went out of business, they gave us all their old files. All, every single uh, new uh, paper is bound into a big, thick, big, thick. We got like 10 or 10 or 12. Thank uh, Jim for all the work. Stand up, what's, Jim. What's that? Yeah, there's one. He brought one. Yeah, we've got, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 of those. Are, they're big and goes all the way back into the 40s, I believe. There's like 50. What's that? 70. 70. Oh, oh. 74. 74. <laughs> We're trying to find a place to put them in the. 1958 to 2008. Yeah, we worked with Jackie. Jackie was very helpful. In fact, we used Jackie. Yes. Jackie's truck to get him over here. Jim, Jim, Jim went over there, and I don't know how empty it was. And they were heavy, and they were dark, and it was cold, and they were damp, and uh, <laughs> uh, down in the basement, we had to drag them up. So, uh, good, good job, Jim. Good job. Very. Before we move on from the books, uh, this is the first time I've seen them because they got them while I wasn't here over the winter. And I understand we have to figure out how to store them. Probably. Yes. So, you know, we do fundraising, and we don't do a very good job of it, but um, we probably are going to have to do some more fundraising to figure out how to properly serve those. Uh, so I just want to throw that yeah. out. Anybody, no, that to help That's us. a project for this, this spring and summer, getting those books properly. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be really nice for a collection. Now, are you serious, or are you well, kidding? Well, those are things people toss in their outhouse. Oh, you, we no, have I'm done, serious. Yeah. We have done so many privy digging. You would not believe the stuff that we have found because back then people would self-medicate and they would take their alcohol bottles and they would throw them down in the privy. That's where we find most of our bottles. Uh, and the privy is a perfect, yeah, it's a, it's a perfect uh, garbage dump. So we'll be, we'll be looking you up in the future for some projects. Thanks, Pam. Uh, Mayor Carrie N.T. Neville Thomas, she just sent us an email reply to Joyce asking, and I don't know if anybody's had a chance to see it. Uh, she says, I know, I know this is from Carrie, Mayor, I know I have talked to various board members over the past month, and just to make sure I respond to all of you, I want to send you this email. Thank you for reaching out, and we have been busy behind the scenes. I have requested to the city manager, that's Devin Mazaput, who's that the significant events for the New Brighton Historical Society are included on our city's calendar. While this has not been a past practice for any non-city organizations, Devin, the city manager, agrees that New Brighton Area Historical Society is a treasure for our community, and these two events have been on our website. Uh, the mayor and her husband couldn't join us tonight because they're doing something with Council Member Pam Axberg, but they will be helping us clean up um, our annual cleanup, so that's great. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention tonight, besides we've got some prizes, is a year from now when we do our annual meeting, 
I do have an idea for a meeting, and it's called Scouting in New Brighton. So we have a Eagle Scout project that happened right outside these planners. That was done by Police Chief Tony's son a, lot, a couple of years ago. And this year, we've got an Eagle Scout project. A kid is working on a little free library that's going to go outside of our depot. And it's going to be an exact replica of the depot, filled, filled with books. And it's going to, when we're going to put a cement base down, and it's going to go next to uh, Lenny Clums' uh, bench that Joyce had set up. So that's, we're looking forward to that, and that will be done in about 10 months. So it would be nice if we did a program, I think, that's my idea, on scouting in New Brighton and have different people come in and talk about their, their uh, whether they were Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or whatever the Scouts are. We've got some prizes. I gave out everybody a ticket. Did anybody not get a ticket? A ticket? Would you like to have ticket 35? Does anybody else have ticket 35? No, no. You got ticket 35 because 34 was the last one. Okay. So here's the prizes that we've got. And then when I call out the numbers, uh, I'm just going to set the prizes out on a, the table over here and basically just go over there and take whatever prize you want. We have uh, Dairy Queen cones, coupons. We have Cowboy Jack gift cards, Acapulco gift cards. Acapulco is no longer here, but you can go to other Acapulcos with it. Uh, we have a Cup Foods baseball hat. It's actually a nice hat. This Cup Foods gives us the, uh, the free cookies that everyone's eating tonight, so we like to thank Cup Foods for that. Uh, we have two free memberships, so if you don't already have a membership, then I call your number. That could be something you could have tonight. And an uh, Easter fun baking kit, where you bake this little Easter egg house with, uh, with kids. So the numbers that were picked were number 10, should be like 763010, okay? So the last number is 10, and the next winner is ticket number 13. And 15 and 18. Just to understand, are these people supposed to go pick, or what? Because they don't know what they're supposed to. Yeah. Be it, so if you want, just hang on to the ticket, and then I'll put the prizes up. Okay. Well, they're not there yet. Okay. So 10, 13, 15, 18, 20, 23, 25, 28. 31 and 35. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to give the mic back to Fred because the meeting is still live. Yeah, sure. I think we're just about wrapped up here. Don't forget we've got rhubarb jam over there that goes awfully fast during the summer. So you guys can have a preview of it here. I think it's five dollars a container. Is that right, Eric? Sure. And it's a fundraiser, you know? It's about fundraising. So, uh, any other questions? We thank you all for coming. Uh, and I guess this will officially move to adjourn. adjourn the meeting. I move to adjourn. Thank you. Mary, what's up? I'll make a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. Jacket. A motion to adjourn. We got a second. Uh, we have a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
the home is no longer